things you wouldn't write in the Bible if Calvinism were true. Jesus said, whoever causes one of the little ones to stumble, it would be better if a millstone were placed around his neck and he was cast into the sea. Jesus doesn't like people who hurt children. But if Calvinism is true, of course, the uh, source of the of everything that happens, including everything, every cause is, God, God, is from God uh, by his eternal decree before the world began. And if it didn't happen exactly the way he decreed, and he is the cause of all, cause of all things contingent, and he decreed exactly what would happen and without the possibility to do otherwise, I'm just repeating what Calvinists say accurately, then although it's, can, it's um, categorically possible that children aren't hurt, the reason they are is because of the decree of God from eternity past, and it couldn't be otherwise. So God could have stopped it if he hadn't decreed it, but he, but he can't. Um, and it's not that God doesn't, didn't want to decree it. He's in charge of his decrees. But he decreed it, otherwise the evil is purposeless. So, um, But yet, if that's true, then that would have been a great time for Jesus to explain secondary causation being morally culpable when something else is the primary cause which is what the Calvinists say we're wrong about, but we're not Calvinists. But Jesus sure kind of messed that one up. Not only, not, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to make an argument from silence, but I'm just commenting that that would have been a great time to make that uh, such important truth that Calvinists think we need to believe and wonder if we're re regenerates for not believing it. I would think, are you, are you, I so say, I don't believe Calvinists operate on, on, as if that's true, like normally. Like, cause I, don't, I don't think you can be made in the image of God and wanting to um, please Christ. And because I think Calvinists are Christians, I just don't think it's possible to actually believe that. I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Um, but it's clear to me that the, Jesus said those words, and if he wanted me to be a Calvinist, he would have said it there, the Calvinist distinctions, but he didn't. And in fact, what he does say... Um, very much, uh, to me anyway, and logically it seems, uh, want to teach that. And Jesus was teaching that, in fact, not all things are caused by God. Um, and and most Christian of, his, of Christian history believes that God knows that that would happen. And that's where we should have to be having the conversation, how that works. Some people will disagree with that and say he didn't know. I think he did. But I'm, I'm open to different possibilities. But I'm not open to the idea that I should believe God is the ultimate cause of hurting children. And Jesus seems to agree with me because I don't think he wants to drown his father. A new one I thought of was, um, and I'm waiting for Calvinists to give any kind of good answer to that. Um, and, and I also want to know why they constantly, even the best of them, James White, R.C. Sprawl, John MacArthur, they forget and they say words like allow. Why is that? Again, because I don't think Calvinists actually believe that deep down. And when I say that, I'm saying I'm, you're not lying. I'm not saying you're lying. I'm saying it's a deep psychological thing. And we all have those things. Uh, we don't know why we do things or believe things. We say all sorts of things we think we are the reasons that probably aren't. Because of how psychology is. The, re, uh, the, the things about psychology that are certainly true. And about human minds. And the things, the way we operate. Uh, everybody does that, I, I suspect. Um, another one I thought of today is just simple verses that just are the Calvinist distinctions in the minds of the author when God's inspiring them to write his revealed word. What, do you think about this? Calvinists will often say, oh, when it says you you got to keep the, like, if you let me keep my commandments or here's the patience of the saints. And I'm, I'm kind of okay with this, even though they're trying to get out of, like, God telling you to obey. Well, if he does, you will. So all the, when he says, when you read that the saints have attributes and they obey God because they walk in the spirit. Okay. Yeah, it's God's work. Okay. Sure. I believe that. But what do you, how does that work? God provides you, uh, you, uh, surrender, uh, you give over to God, your, your will by the power of the Holy spirit. You know, I am persuaded that he is able to keep, to keep that which I have entrusted unto him. So Paul has no problem with saying we uh, 
uh, practice faith. And you know, he's not always going to, you know, say Calvinism is true. If, so Calvinists, don't be afraid. Look, it says you must save yourselves or you must do this. He tells people that without explaining Calvinism. Okay. I, it, I'm not saying um, you have to muster up your ability to be good enough. I'm just saying we, it, the Bible speaks that way. Okay. So here, think about this. So my point there was like, Calvinists will say, well, no, it's just descriptive. It's like, okay, fine. God gives you the power to, to obey and the saints do the things that God wants them to do. You look at it a little bit differently of how that works philosophically. And I think it's dangerous to think that way because it puts the blame on God and it makes us not as guilty for what we freely do. Uh, and the fact that we do it, we do things against God, even as believers sometimes, um, and God offers forgiveness. You can't really understand that it fully, in my opinion, it seems, if you think God determined uh, all your sins for you to do. No, Calvin, you need to go a little further, in my opinion. I cannot, I will not affirm such a thing according to what Scripture says. Some things are of the world and not of God. Game over. God declares there's things not from him. God declares there's things he did not decree. Jeremiah, I didn't decree it or command it. Is what he didn't mean. Is what, I know this. When he said I didn't decree it, I don't care what the context is. He said I didn't decree it. Calvinists say, well, he did. And I say in a sense, that I'll, I'll even give you, I'll throw you a bone. I'll be like, if God knows the future, then he decreed it in the, in the I've always kind of thought of everything as being decreed, but in, not like the Calvin. It's just that like God has decreed to let these things happen. I'm not exactly sure how that he operates thinking about that in time. I have no idea how that works with God. We're not God. You're a person. We operate with the way God gave us of our perception. And that is not a part, that's not a purview of our perception. So don't pretend like you know, you don't, especially when it makes God, uh, uh, you know, responsible for, for people's evil and they couldn't do otherwise. No, he offers a way of escape so that you may bear it. He tells the Israelites, don't say you can't. I've made it near to you so that you may. And I want you to. And is what we know is that they didn't in the way God wanted them to. And so that's another game over. He said, don't say, he's like, this is the kind of thing you're going to say. Who will go over the sea and get it for us? Who will come down from heaven to bring it to us? He's like, you're going to say stupid stuff like that. Don't do that. Because you can obey, and I want you to, and I command you to. And they didn't. So why make up something that is opposed to what's revealed in Scripture and call it a prescriptive will and say, it's like me saying, yeah, the Bible teaches that Jesus didn't lose any. The Bible says, it does say that. But then it says, except one. So it's like, look, uh, don't make theology that you derive philosophically and logically from a system and say, well, there's this thing that the Bible doesn't tell us that, ca that makes it so what God has told us is exactly not true. Like, don't do something, and then you do it, and you say, well, that was a prescriptive will. He, like, he, in a sense, he didn't want us to do it, but it's what he really wanted was for us to do it, and he made it so we couldn't have done otherwise. That is retarded. You are retarded. That is, that is, I'm sorry, that, I mean, that's what I really think. I don't think Calvinists are retarded. I just think that's so obviously false. And just like a, a, uh, like a, a dingleberry, if you will. They're not meant, they're not good. They're not like, you don't want those things, you know? Um, but the, that leads into my last one that I just thought of. It's just a simple thing. Just think about this. If, if God is saying, well, it's descriptive. You don't, you don't like obey because that kind of sounds like works-based salvation. No, Jesus says, obey the commandments. Okay? You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to do it. You are able to operate and opportunities arise, and you get to choose, and that's how the world works, and you're supposed to choose what God says to do. I, I don't see how you'd want to argue with that, considering how the Bible talks. Choose the right thing when the opportunity comes, and you're sitting there, and you're deciding whether you're going to lie or cheat or steal when you have the opportunity, and you have the whole, and if, you, if you have the Holy Spirit, sometimes you're going to fail. 
And if you love God and you have a relationship with God, you're going to repent of that in your prayer time. And then um, you're going to say that because when you repent, you're admitting you're wrong. From you're you're admitting you missed the mark. If God determined for that to happen, then how is that missing the mark? No, you hit the mark exactly where God said. Otherwise, it'd be a rogue molecule, wouldn't it? Yeah, but that's just the uh, uh, the prescriptive thing and self-evident in reality. But but God really wanted it to happen, did He? He allowed it to happen. That's the answer. And you're and then He says you're not supposed to do that. Don't do that. It's bad for you. Okay, that means He doesn't want you to. Act, he actually doesn't want you to do it because it's, it's evidently wrong because we're Christians we, we agree with God who says I don't like sin and when you do it you repent and the world is going to be lost because of their sin but I'm offering a way of escape if you choose to take it and if you take it you're con- you will be conformed to the image of the Son by necessity for, for making that choice and that was that is what was set for the foundation of the world he's speaking to those who are believing in Christ in this way of salvation uh, for us, present tense, who are believing, uh, this will occur. We will be conformed to the image of the Son. And this was the w- in the context is the way God was planning that had been revealed now in his time. That was the mystery. So Calvinism, gone. Dispensational, gone. Interpretation of the mystery. I, I believe that's what that's saying. That's what that's meant to say. Not that there's two Gospels and not that um, God chose people individually before the world began. No, it doesn't say that. I mean, it's possible you could read it that way. It doesn't demand you read it that way. And I would say the reasons, there's just, there's too many obviously uh, anti-justice uh, that God describes in the Torah, like equal weights and measures, uh, responsibility, and the way punishments are doled out for, and what your responsibilities are. Uh, it just doesn't jive with that. And that's what God has given us. Secret things belong to the Lord, but that which he's revealed to us it's for us and our children uh, forever, by the way. So uh, you, don't get to, you don't get to figure out the secret will of God that God didn't reveal. That's secret. So don't tell me God has a secret will that you figured out that's contrary to what he's actually said because the word of God is what's revealed to us. It's amazing that Protestants can say something like they do for the sake of their system. Um, God died for your uh, disobedience. Not so that you would believe Calvinism. Okay? And if you don't like that, and you don't agree with that, then just start being real and saying non-Calvinists haven't been regenerated because that's the implication of that. If you believe that, then believe it and preach it because if it's true, those who who aren't Calvinists are not regenerated. I don't see how... I've never understood how how Calvinists could honestly think non-Calvinists unless you think they're going... I mean, maybe I guess you could say... They're like, they're going to get there. But if they don't get there before they die, they're not regenerate. See, you're, you're, well, they're not Christians then. Because you say you can't be a Christian. So actually that excuse wouldn't work. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud. But the last verse I was just going to say is, okay, Calvin, so you say it's descriptive and not prescriptive. I thought the things God said to do are pre- is part of his prescriptive will. And it's when you don't do it that he determined that as his decree, or his ultimate will. So how can you say it's descriptive when it's, those are the things that are called prescriptive? The part of the, his prescriptive will. Is that a different kind of prescription? I don't know. Maybe it is. Uh, I think if you look into the uh, what those words mean, that doesn't make any sense to say that. And it, I think even as a Calvinist, even if you believe such weirdness about God making it so you couldn't do anything otherwise, you should. there's no problem with saying you're supposed to keep the commandments and it's prescriptive anyway. Because Paul talks that way all the time. You do something and it, and it has an effect. Like, go and make sure you examine yourselves. Make sure you do this. Save, and he even says stuff like save, you know, to save yourself. He says save yourself. Now, that sounds bad. I would never say that. But in a context, he's operating and saying you, you do stuff. So it's dumb to say otherwise. So, okay. So, but okay, let's say it is uh, just a description of what saints do. Because it's not wrong. When Jesus... Look, Jesus, right? He spa- he sp- when Jesus speaks, uh, when he commands something to stand fast and exist, right? By the breath of his mouth, the stars were formed. He spoke and it stood fast. 
So when he said to the woman caught in adultery, when, his, when her accusers left, and he looks at her and he, the last thing he says is, go and sin no more. He just said, that sounds really descriptive. Right? Or was he asking her to? See, she either went on and never sinned anymore, and she had sinless perfectionism, or Jesus' command, go and sin no more, was impotent because, she, but because I'm guessing you think she probably sinned because you'd be insane if you thought otherwise. But it seems like if you're a Calvinist, you should think she never sinned because Jesus just said, go and sin no more. He declared it. See, here's the options. If she did, she either, she either never sinned again, which would be consistent because Jesus commanded it out loud. The guy whose voice makes things exist. He said that to her. Was he, or he was lying. And so he's not the savior because he sinned. He misled her. Because she should have been believing what God commands has to happen. Because it can't happen otherwise. Jesus is God. He commanded her, do not go and sin no more. So he was either lying, impotent. And that is, he made a declaration, as Calvin is say, as God. And it didn't come to pass. Because he didn't have the power somehow. But I wonder, I wonder if those were rogue molecules then, her, her bodies. Not that people are mere molecules, right? But everything we do is because God decreed it. Was that a decree that Jesus told her? Was he, was he, what, did you, so what, which is it? To me, it seems like you should say, um, I, don't, I don't know what you can say. How does that command, can that command be truthful? on a Calvinistic philosophical uh, basis. Which is it, Calvinist? That's the question. Was she a sinless perfectionist because God commanded her to go and sin no more? Do you think she did? If you think she did, which is obviously the right answer, uh, Jesus was either lying or he was impotent. And he didn't, he, but now we have Jesus, fully God, truly God, commanding something that was, in, why, why wouldn't it happen? What he, what he demanded or what he commanded or what he said, what he spoke and spoke out loud, go and sin no more. He was either impotent, lying, or she was she never sinned again, or uh, he he was encouraging her because of the circumstances. She was just threatened to, to be killed by men that were being uh, misusing the law, wanting to kill her. Is it, is it technically you can kill an adulteress if you have the right the right circumstances to condemn her, which may be the reason why they couldn't condemn her. But Jesus was off, was showing her mercy by helping her out of that circumstance. And when they left and he said, go and sin no more, here's the right answer. Obviously, Jesus doesn't want us to sin because it, it's harmful. And he wants us to be, to prosper and have life. And we choose uh, whether or not we sin. And so when we do, it's our fault fully. Sometimes you, you sin and you have to. But if that's actually the case, you're not at least as guilty. You might have, there might be some need for cleansing, but you are not morally culpable and worthy of hell if you sinned and someone made you sin, right? So, uh, what's it going to be? The, the only answer is that she had the option to to go and sin no more or not. Not that she could just conjure up sinless perfectionism, but that through the through seeking God in a relationship with God and by faith through Christ and the true God of Israel, if if she turned to Him, He would empower her with the Spirit. You know, we know this theologically. I'm not saying this is in the story of the text, but that's the idea. We should. That's how we should look at that. He was saying, woman, I love you. You're my creation, right? And he was saying, when you sin, it's harmful for you and it, and it hurts me. And I want to see you prosper. So I'm, in, I'm saying, I love you. Don't let yourself get into the circumstance again, lest the worst thing come upon you. It's a loving statement. He's encouraging her to choose to follow him. And that, he, and that you know, we know, late, we know he provides uh, power to do that. And it's a growing process. Because he wants what's best for us. But because uh, of our state, sometimes we mess up. 
but we have forgiveness. So that's the right answer. All the other answers are garbage because they wouldn't be true. If Jesus, if Jesus is God, if he, if he wanted to make it happen that she never sinned, he could. Even if you're not a Calvinist, if he wanted to control everything, he could. We believe he could because he's sovereign. We just think he doesn't because it's unjust. And he's doing this for a purpose. He's allowing things for a purpose. That's why I'm, a, that's why I'm an Adventist. He is quest, he's allowing things to happen to demonstrate who he is so that people can freely choose to follow him and he'll empower them to do so by trusting him. And the way that you do that is by seeing how, who God is through his uh, service to humans because of his love for them. Not a, is a display of power. It flies in the face of the entire gospel story of what God did. Humbled himself. Washed feet. Sh- was an example for that. That is not what a powerful God does in the way that Calvinists want to make uh, complain about non-Calvinist theology. That's dumb. It's missing the whole picture of why what God did is so beautiful. One of the aspects of why it's so beautiful. The mercy of God. Him desiring people to come to him and making a way for that. So, and he certainly wasn't impotent. He could have done it. So that's not the right answer. So, did he really want her to go and sin no more? Do you think she did? I, I, I suppose I, I almost can guarantee you. I bet my life on. It, I bet my. I bet your eternal soul that doesn't exist on it. But I, in the sense of intrinsically, if you're a believer, you have eternal life. But I'll bet your immortal soul she sinned again. And I'll bet Jesus was telling the truth of his desire for her not to sin anymore when he said that. But I, I think she probably did. And that she received forgiveness if she trusted in Christ because she would have the spirit and know that when she did fall, she could get back up and repent and continue her journey following the true God demonstrated in Jesus. So Jesus was just caring for her. If Calvinism were true, she should have had sinless perfectionism. Do you, do you, what, Calvinists, give me a reason why those don't exhaust all the possibilities. And why that statement right there alone um, proves that the distinctions in your uh, differences with non-Calvinists are not feasible. They're really just not true. They're clearly not true. No effect. I love you. I think you're great Christians a lot of the time. I think you can be a Christian as a Calvinist, but not because of Calvinism. But because you want to follow God and you're doing what you can. And... Uh, I'd love to hear a response.